Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of I Like to Read with me, your host, Rachel Polanski. Um, Again, I apologize to the audio listeners, but for the viewers at home, how fun are these pants? Um, (laughs) Again, not a fashion podcast, but these are from Anthropology, which is usually painfully expensive and you know i don't need to disclose how much these were and i mean honestly in terms of anthropology prices for a very good quality fun pair of pants that i can wear in lounging as well as in the outside world they really weren't that expensive um they also have a fun thing called afterpay a lot of websites use this where you can split your payment into four installments no interest not sponsored um but that way you know you only pay a quarter of it up front and then you pay it every two weeks the other three installments and so like yeah you're still paying the same price but it doesn't feel like it um you know it's, it's I don't it's hard for me to find a good pair of pants that I like truly love that's especially like unique and flattering and I think I kind of found it in these ones um also it's getting a little bit cooler I mean Los Angeles doesn't really have seasons we don't even really have fall um but it's not like 500 degrees um it's cool enough that midday we can keep the ac off and i can wear some pants although they are still you know like flowy and breezy i don't know if i'm ready to like commit to tight leggings and like actual constricting pants yet or anytime soon um other than that hey hello it's new oh sorry kitty you can't come out my cat will be fan favorite um was in the podcast at the beginning lovingly on the pillow now he doesn't seem to really want to be and i tried to get him to he didn't want to now he wants to try to get out of the room but the door is locked i'm so sorry but do you want to be on the show do you want to be it made me like you know like my favorite murder type cat fans we'll get that going um okay um so blah blah, blah. um sometimes I don't really feel like recording and today was like on uh, one of those days I don't want to you know totally disclose that but I read so many books that I was like I can't not record I mean sometimes I will either double up or I'll go a week without recording but since I'm reading so much I feel like if I don't talk about those books and then they just pile up I'm gonna forget about them and clearly you know if you've been listening you know that I'm already not I already don't have the best memory and rec- name recollection um so, but I wanted to give these five books the justice that they deserve. They deserve their own episode, just like the other ones. So, without further ado, here we go. Da, 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 da. Uh, we're getting crazier as the show goes on, right? You know, first you just have to deal with weird audio issues. Now you have to deal with just, like, weird person issues. Just kidding. It's not issues. I'm normal. Uh, okay, Transcendent Kingdom by Yag Yassi. I hope I'm saying that right. Um, So this is her second novel. The first one, Homecoming, I've heard is amazing. Um, This one just came out and I was lucky enough to snag a copy from the library. Um, Homecoming, I have a hold on. Otherwise, I would have talked about them in tandem, but maybe we'll get to that soon. Um, So Homecoming, or sorry, <laughs> Transcendent Kingdom focuses on a young woman named Gifty. Um, she is a studying for her PhD at Stanford. However, she is a, a she and her family are originally from Ghana um, and then moved to Alabama when she was a young girl. Um, she, her mother, um, she has a lot of issues with her family naturally. She also has a lot of issues with her younger brother who we find out at the beginning of the novel died from an overdose. Um, but then the novel kind of intertwines within sort of the present day as she's trying to figure out her situation she actually goes back to Ghana and reflects on some things with her family um intertwined with when her brother is still alive and like the enticing incident that led to his addiction and his slow yet ultimately pretty quick decline well in case again for the uh viewing people uh we got a new mic stand (laughs) I am technologically inept um Again, fortunately, Jason is a producer, so he has random things on hand and the bottom of the mic stand broke and now we can have it on this like fun stick thing. So back to Transcendent Kingdom. Um, It's also Transcendent Kingdom. The title kind of plays into the religion or lack of religion. Um, The faith that she continues to grapple with is very prevalent in this novel. Like, you know, how much can I rely on God and an other power versus how much can I rely on myself and separating sort of like what she's been taught and her past versus like how she's developing her own sense of self Um, so this is just really beautifully written um it brings us a fun 
I mean, a dysfunctional family, what family isn't dysfunctional, but it just, it read really well. I've read it in a night. Um, and just if you're looking for a slightly deeper family, internal turmoil, drama, um, that's very, you know, nothing crazy about it in a good way, though. I don't think it would have worked if it went crazy and in a bunch of weird directions. Um, so that is Transcendent Kingdom. Next we have The Second Home by Christina Clancy. So when I first started reading this, I mean, it's about a second family home in the Cape um, and then a group of children who inherit it from their parents. And so, I mean, I feel like there's so many like beach reads, Cape Cod house, like women finding themselves. And so that's kind of like what I thought this was going to be, but I was actually pleasantly surprised. It's the house itself is so much of a character, but it's really like this, the sibling, the very unique sibling dynamic um, that takes place in this as well as um, the flashbacks so the fa the parents that own this house die so we fl we are kind of go back and forth between the present and the siblings dealing with the ramifications of that and selling the house and the property um and the past um like i believe it's like 20 years ago in the summer um these two sisters and their parents go to the house for the summer they also have an adopted brother um who's 16 which leads to a lot of issues um there's just a lot of like i mean first i went to the cape a bunch as a kid i'm from massachusetts you know we never had a cape house or anything but we we're lucky enough usually like one week a summer we would just like go up and rent a small um like cab use not a cabin sort of like a little, little resort type thing i make it sound a lot fancier than it is so um this book the house is in wellfleet um, and so that's sort of like the outer cape area so i'm not as familiar with that area but again like going there every year for 20 years plus I, I know the area so it was really nice to just know that the author herself clearly has a love and connection with Cape Cod as well and that's very evident in this book but it's you know the Cape is the background that sets it to it but it's not it is a Cape Cod novel but it's not like it's really about the family it's about their dynamics it's just wonderful that it happens to take place in Cape Cod, an area I'm familiar with. This book probably would have worked just as well were it like the Hamptons or Long Island or the Jersey Shore or whatever, but because it's Cape Cod, it has an extra special place in my heart. And I think also that sort of like old fashioned New England tradition, um, especially at play, the family is from uh, the Midwest and I think it's Wisconsin. So the contrast of that is something that I personally don't have. I'm from New England myself, too. So to see that sort of like background for the Cape, which makes it even like a specialer piece of New England if you're not already from there, um, that's super interesting to see explored as well. Um, so don't, you know, don't discount this one as sort of just like another Cape Cod beach read. Like it, it, it seems like that, but it's really a deeper, meatier family novel and the family dynamic um, and characters are a little bit different than something from this novel. It's by no means like murders and darks, but there's, you know, there's family secrets and betrayals and all that shit without it seeming like a soap opera. Like it really does seem like as crazy as the situation is, like it's something that could, you know, really happen. Um, because when kids are young, shit happens. And then when you're older, it's hard to recover from those wounds. I mean, Lord knows I don't have to preach that. <laughs> Anyways. Next we have When No One Is Watching by Alyssa Cole. So this is like, I mean, Goodreads itself is describing it as rear window meets get out. And I totally had like get out vibes um, from this novel. Um, so Sydney is our main character. She lives in a area of Brooklyn that up until now has like tried to resist gentrification for as long as possible, but is slowly seeping in in the ways that everything is. So Sydney is a black woman and her mother um, owns this brownstone, which is like a very hot commodity piece of realty. Um, so it could kind of start as sort of like, oh, the neighborhood's getting bought back, but it becomes like much more, you know, it seems at first like she's crazy and there might be like all these conspiracy theories, but then like people in the neighborhood, especially people of color, like with important properties, like start going missing out of nowhere. And then like one day the convenience store um, just all of a sudden turns into something else. People are like, no, they never lived there. Whereas like I mean, it's definitely a heightened metaphor of gentrification, but it's not totally impossible. Um, and so then Sydney um, befriends her white neighbor, Theo, um, who is married or, you know, sort of separated. He moved to the neighborhood with a previous relationship and that separated. Um, and so 
it's Theo's a white character, and so it's interesting. You know, he's not the protagonist. He's sort of the sidekick to Sydney, but he um, is also sort of a foil. I mean, inherently in their race and their gender, they're different, but they ultimately come together. Um, there's that mystery, like what's happening to the neighborhood, what's this craziness vibe. There's that sociocultural um, aspect to it, which elevates it from sort of that just like crazy conspiracy theory. I mean, it's almost like an episode of The Twilight Zone, too. Um, and it's just, it's, again, it's very timely. It's very, you know, parts of it seem almost too crazy to be real. But when you, you read about things, and I mean, I'm living in a neighborhood myself where I am sort of the gentrification and you see it happening and it's happening a lot slower because of COVID, but it's really not impossible to think that the things that happen in this book um, could happen in real life someday soon or are already happening. Um, so check that one out. Next we have The Comeback by Ella Berman. Um, and again, back to like setting in novels. I, th I think I've said this before, but really just like if it's set in a place that I've either lived or, you know, have a particular affinity for, um, and I've lived in, you know, only a few places, you know, I lived in right outside of Boston for growing up for my life. I lived in Burlington, Vermont, when I went to college at University of Vermont. And of course, now I've been living in Los Angeles. But each of those three places has such a special place in my heart. And I'm lucky enough that in each of those three places, I wasn't confined to just that specific city. I was able to explore the larger area. And I do love, loved, you know, going out to eat and exploring and getting to know sort of the establishments that make up that area. So whenever um, a novel or a memoir paints that picture and sets it in that place really well and makes that setting kind of come alive as another sort of character. Um, I love that. And so the comeback takes place in Los Angeles, a place that I've been living, you know, for over four years and is very special to my heart. However, um, the story is a little bit different than what I've experienced. Um, Grace Turner is a young woman. I believe she's like 22. Um, we start with her. She's just moving back in with her family in Anaheim. Um, throughout the novel, we learned that she starting from a young age, was a very successful up-and-coming actress. She had everything going for her, you know, like living the child star dream. They moved from London, bought her family a house in England. Then, um, you know, there's hints of it towards the beginning, but you, of course, get a very strong sense that something isn't right with her manager, her much older manager, and, you know, she's definitely being taken advantage of and the ramifications of that and sort of how she then deals with that as a young woman. Um, I read then in the afternoon that this was written before the Me Too movement. Um, of course, you know, the Me Too movement did not come out of nowhere. It came because of, you know, abuse and power that um, was happening for years and wasn't going unspoken. It was finally spoken. And so this, the comeback, um, is another take on that. It just shows, you know, how young women kind of get taken advantage of, how hard it is to really finally come clean about that and, you know, how it impacts the lives of individuals so strongly and how hard it is to voice those things, especially before the Me Too movement, when it really, you know, you did, these men were so powerful, like to out them and to speak publicly against them was a really big deal. Um, so that novel deals with all of that. Grace is just like a really wonderful written character. Um, she's only 22 or 23, but because she started in the industry so young, because she was the main breadwinner for her family and exposed to all of these like, very adult opportunities. She is jaded and bitter and, you know, seems like someone my age, if not much older, but just because of what she's been through. I mean, she was married at like 19 and she doesn't have kids, but I mean, she does have a younger sister. Um, so their dynamic is very well thought out. Um, her family dy I mean, dynamic is very <sighs> realistic. I mean, it's not it's a very realistic of what it's like to be exposed to fame at such a young age and to then burn out and or you know vie away from it especially you know being taken advantage of as such a young woman um and it just was very engrossing it's fictional of course but a lot you know it could have it could be the story of any young woman and the fact that it is fiction allows the author to uh really get into these details in a way that because she has the freedom to separate it from something that really happened, you know, take some, taking some of those details, but shaping her own story um, that can serve as a lesson for other people. So um, if you just, you know, it's all set to the backdrop of Los Angeles and the Hollywood scene and just lots of different landmarks that I'm familiar with. So reading that, I mean, I'm in Los Angeles now, but it <laughs> doesn't really feel like it when we don't really leave, you know, the few mile radius surrounding our apartment to do um, 
necessary things so it just you know I haven't been to Malibu or Santa Monica which are like literally 10 miles 15 miles at the most uh in forever so it was nice to at least kind of revisit that through literature um and last but very not least we have funny weather art in an emergency by Olivia Lang I really loved this book um I even you know pulled a few quotes from it that I found so profound that I'm hoping to use in my upcoming Daisy of Love writing piece which uh side side note um it's crazy like how writing <laughs> writing works you know I've, I've always loved writing but I haven't ever like really thought about my writing is like really you know something that could be published somewhere and or something that a piece that's at least like sort of publishable enough condition as opposed to just like random thoughts I've thrown everywhere academic pieces so you know that has I finished my nonfiction writing class but it's still being worked on because I want it to you know even if it doesn't get published or out anywhere I just want to at least have a full piece that I'm comfortable with and that I fully workshopped and just the workshopping process is crazy I mean I'm already on like the third iteration of the paper it's come in such a long way and it's just it's I you know the guidance of my teacher Rachel Verona Cote has been amazing and so it's become less of a socio-cultural exploration and more of a Rachel exploration and a personal piece and I have done a lot of raw personal prosaic writing but I've never really shared that um so it's interesting to you know talk about some of my past demons and what I want to share and what I don't want to share and like what's interesting and what's not interesting um but there's a couple of quotes about loneliness and performativity which are kind of what I'm touching on in that piece as well I'm still working still working on it you know we'll get it done eventually um but it's really you know it's, it's teaching me how to learn to write again and how to go through this whole process and you know the ideas and the love and passion for that subject have always been there and that's what you really need with the process it takes to get to your core ideas is not so easy um but funny weather art in an emergency is just a wonderful collection of essays um they fluctuate between specific vignettes and portraits of authors that olivia imagines their lives and talks about their works you know in a more personal way um combined with sort of like looking at larger movements um she also just like looks at the idea of art and the idea of looking and the spectator and performativity and loneliness and commodification of culture um so she you know the first whether it's just a really nice mix of you know she when she's talking about the individual authors she weaves in a little bit of her, her artists her personal details um but then the latter half of the book really deals with um she does like pieces about artists um p particularly um, like writers and Chris Krause is one of them who I also love and just their impact on her and her takes and she's been a writer for so long so so many of these essays um, were written you know five or six years ago but are still super timely and as someone who is you know woefully ignorant in terms of art history and just art you know paintings and all that jazz because I'm not good at it so I, <laughs> I would always just kind of ignore it but it's there's so much rich history and rich societal stuff there that I just kind of tune out or choose not to pay attention to and so as someone who's not familiar with it I definitely I also learned a lot um and it's written for it's not written you know an art history textbook or a review with the Whitney you know it's written um from someone who just knows how to write nonfiction very well um so that's it this was another little bit of a shorter one um but i just wanted to get this out there because i wanted to talk about these books that's not phallic at all um i hope you all enjoyed this i hope that you know we're in fall it's weird it's a weird time but i hope that you know reading is keeping you sane or something is keeping you sane um but until next time stay reading bye <laughs>